Hi guys, and welcome to a very different type of video for the channel. I figured with the impending release of FM21 and the beta already being out, now would be as good a time as any to make a video, quite simply, about the things I wish I knew when I started playing Football Manager, because I feel like it could have made my experience a lot better and a lot easier when I first picked up the game uh, six, seven years ago. Now, of course, those of you down in the comments, if you do have any more things you would add to this list for a brand new player, absolutely put them down there too. And if you are a new player, don't be afraid to ask things in the comments of this video. Either myself or someone much, much smarter than me will no doubt have an answer for you. Or better yet, come ask me personally in one of my Twitch streams. I'm sure that myself and again, people that were much smarter than me in the chat will be able to help you out with any questions you have. Link in the description, so go follow there as well. In fact, I'm actually going to be streaming directly after this video goes live. So there you go. Now, normally I feel like I should save the most important advice till the end, but I want to get this one front loaded because I do think it's the most important thing I have to say on the topic. And that is when you first get the game, you're going to be completely overwhelmed with what team you actually want to play with a lot of the time because, you know, it's a brand new thing. There's quite a lot of difficult settings and whatnot. You want to make sure you pick the right team for your first save so you get the best experience. The best advice I can give is twofold. Either pick a massive team, like a massive team. I, I'm, I'm my Spurs save at the moment um, just because it's convenient for me right now. That would be perfect as well. Um, any sort of big Premier League side, big European side, a Bayern Munich, a Barcelona, Real Madrid, etc. One of those types of teams because you'll just have an easier time of it in general. You'll be able to get wins without really trying that hard a lot of the time and it will allow you to learn the game mechanics without the pressure of being in more obscure leagues with more ridiculous league rules and players and whatnot and having to like really figure out the minutiae. Or alternatively, take over the club that you actually support in real life and I'd argue that this one might actually be the better one because you will already have knowledge of the players of that club you will know who's good and who's not now that may not perfectly translate into FM but it will give you a massive boost over a club that you have no real connection to potentially so managing your own side is way better because you already have all of that knowledge built in to begin with so you can start straight off the bat knowing exactly who to put where and what potential type of tactic to play just because you've watched them in real life and speaking of overwhelmingness the game as far as what it lets you control is very detailed. I feel like, particularly when I started playing, I thought that I had to basically control every single thing about the game, and either I found that boring after a while because there was quite a lot of tedious things that perhaps you don't really want to control, or there was just such an overwhelming amount of data that it meant that I didn't really know what to do a lot of the time with it. And I feel like they've actually added a lot more than that since I started playing in 2013, so the chances are it's probably even more overwhelming now. But the important thing to remember about FM is that you can basically control as little or as much about the club as you like. If you really wanted to, you could delegate every single thing to your assistant or various other members of staff at the club and solely control things like tactics. Technically, you could even have them do that as well. I just think that's perhaps not the best idea as there's no real... Uh entertainment value perhaps from that. One of my favourite things to immediately delegate to the staff is things to do with the media because I often find that it can get quite tedious after a while handling the press conferences and stuff, particularly the ones that come up all the time. Questions in the media you'll always get, those are fine, but I do find that sometimes with the repetitive nature of some of the press conferences it's best to delegate that stuff. However, I will say it has been improved in FM21, so I'm trying to give it a chance myself. But when it comes to things like handling contract extensions for staff of your under-19s team, sometimes it's best to just leave that to someone else so you don't have to think about it and focus on the things that you're actually going to enjoy playing about the game. You can always switch them back off later, and the game does make it very, very easy for you to go and delegate these things with a click of a single button. Tip number three, there's nothing wrong with using the built-in tactics that the games come with. There's a reason why they're there. They're literally designed for this exact purpose, and I wish they were in the game when I started playing, because they weren't. When I first picked up FM, you had to jump in and make your tactic from scratch, and I knew nout about what I was doing. Now, obviously, I knew enough about football to build a sort of shape, but I didn't know what a lot of the roles meant. I didn't know what worked well together, and why? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't completely mimic real life football as much as it tries to. Sometimes the best thing you can do when you want to get started is, is instead of creating your own styles, to just pick one of these that you think seems interesting to you and kind of just go from there with it. If you do start to notice things in the patterns of play that you might well want to change, then you can do that. But at least you've got a solid grounding with which to build it on. And in addition to that, don't be afraid to go download a tactic from the internet. There is a ton of different websites where you'll be able to download tactics that people have painstakingly made. Now, it's not something I personally want to do or do now, but it really did help me back when I first started playing because at least then you can sort of get an understanding of why they've created that tactic and what worked so you can use that later down the line and build your own knowledge up to try to make one yourself. So for me, there's really nothing wrong with doing that and I would actively encourage you to do that were you to be a new player. But moving on from that, 
let's say that you do actually want to create your own tactic from scratch and that's something you're interested in. Well, one of the best things I can say to you is pay attention to the descriptions of the roles. I know it sounds silly to actually read this stuff, but I know it can get a bit dense at times, but particularly now that they've actually provided these lovely little animations as well that show you exactly what each role is supposed to do in some kind of context. And that I feel is a huge step in the right direction. Make sure you pay attention to this because some of these things are going to conflict with each other if you try to use them together. And it's a great starting point to then bounce onward with. And to tack onto the end of that, if you happen to be managing in the lower leagues, do not underestimate the importance of physical attributes at that league. They're important at any level, but I feel like particularly in the more obscure and lower leagues where there's less quality overall, having players with good physical abilities, particularly pace and strength and ability, acceleration and whatnot can make a huge difference and give you the edge sometimes. Still on the topic of tactics, be persistent with it. It's the first day of the season. You've been doing some tactics tests in preseason friendlies. You think you've got something that works. You go into that first game and you lose 4-0. That doesn't mean you have to tear up the paper, go back to the drawing board. It might just be that there's a tiny couple of things that you can do to that to make it better. I like to think in the realms of marginal gains. Tiny tweaks over a small two or three game sample size to see if there are any differences being made and then little by little evolving the tactic into where you want it to go. Sometimes Sometimes you might go down the wrong route with that, but you can walk it back. And that's the key thing about doing that. In addition, if you do make too many changes at once, you may well win the next game 3-0, but you may not know why you did that and what changes you made that allowed that to work. And I think knowing why your tactic is working is just as important as the fact that it's working in the first place. The amount of times I found myself in a position where the tactic is now working and we're winning matches, but I couldn't tell you why we are. It's like having a magic tactics box that I put the data in and then the results come out. But I don't know what's going on inside it. Scouting quality is very, very important. Now, obviously, depending on what club you're managing, the quality of scout you're going to be able to get will vary. But you do want them to have as high a uh, judging player potential and player ability as physically possible. Adaptability is quite important too, but those two are the key things. Because any report you get is only going to be that scout's opinion of that player's quality and not their actual quality. So the better your scouts are, the better opinions you're going to get of players. And they will of course generate these player recommendation ratings. Now, just because the number is higher on one player over another doesn't mean that either one is a better player overall or that you are have a better chance at signing one or the other or that it's a better. It's just the scout's opinion in general. And you can get far more details from looking at other factors around that as well. For example, an extremely good player who is very, very expensive or the scouts have rated him as being very expensive will have a lower recommendation because it would cost you more and it is taking that into account along with many other factors when deciding this rating. Try not to waste your transfer budget on a single player. We've all done it from time to time because sometimes you just want to make that marquee signing, but I find it far better to spend it on several different players even if it means that you may not reach that level of quality, because if that player gets injured, which admittedly could happen to anybody, you don't want to be in that position because it could also ruin your finances too. And finances are a very important part of the game that you do need to keep an eye on, particularly if you're managing in the lower leagues or a team that doesn't have a large amount of prize money. Premier League, generally speaking, unless you're leveraging huge amounts of money on transfers, you're probably going to remain solvent for the most part, given the huge TV revenue that comes with it. One thing you can do at the end of every season, it will come through a few months before or maybe like a month before the end of the season. This is more useful for clubs that are not at the very top level, second division and lower really in the major leagues. You'll get a news article through that will list a load of players that have been released by the big clubs. Now there's two of these articles. One will list very older players that have been released, so like 30 plus. Often, you can still pick up some bargains in there, but generally speaking it will cost you a lot of wages and signing on fees. However, there's another article you can get that will always come through every year and will list a load of players usually around about the, between the ages of 17 and 19 that have been released by the largest sides in the country. Always take those players on trial. Doesn't matter if they're any good or not, because you won't know. Most of them will probably be useless to you, but you might be able to find an absolute gem in there. And usually there's at least one a season that's worth picking up if you are playing in the lower divisions. And they can be the difference between, th those guys can genuinely be excellent footballers and you can usually get them for basically nothing because they've been released. Well, literally nothing, in fact. And if you're doing like a lower league English save, that's like a tent pole that you must not miss out on. One of the issues you may run into with contracts potentially is that players are demanding enormous jumps up in wages, which will happen, particularly if you're going up the leagues or the players that had a really good season. One of the things you can do, which I don't see enough people do potentially, is you can have it so that the contract renewal doesn't start until the end of the season. Now, this does two things for a start. It essentially means that the, ha the player is happy because they're getting the new contract and that's all sorted, but it also means that you don't have to pay all that extra money for the rest of the season. Now, there is one slight drawback to this, and that is that the player will have technically not signed the new contract yet, meaning that other clubs will still come and try to sign that player. Usually speaking, if a player signs a new deal, other clubs will piss off. That will not happen with this. So you must be careful because players will still leave potentially if you have done this. I wanted to kind of finish off with just a wellness tip about this because at the end of the day, it is a game. Don't worry about the results too much. It's a game. Have some fun with it. Sometimes losing can be just as enjoyable as winning. Although that might just be because I come from a position of losing quite a lot. You might be tempted to save before a match and then reload if you don't get the result you want. But 
Think about it like this. You lose that match. It gives you vindication later down the line when you do go and get that result. And I feel like the losses make the wins feel so much sweeter. And there is really nothing quite like getting a victory against a team that you've lost to five times in a row. There's something special about FM that it, it's the only game that gives me that feeling. And that is why I believe that you shouldn't really worry too much when you do lose matches because the wins are going to come eventually. And I'll leave you with this because this apparently genuinely happened to someone on my stream. Don't get confused and think that you actually need to wait a week to play each match. Apparently they actually did that. They got the game, played a match, and then thought that they had to genuinely wait a full week in real life before they could play the next one. So don't do that. Or do. Have a good time. Do what you like. So if you have found this video useful in any way, do drop a like. That would be terrific. If you've enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, potentially coming up soon, as well as my more uh, longer story-driven content. And also go follow my Twitch channel. Uh, we stream. Have a good time over there as well. If you've got any questions, do be sure to hop over and ask me them there. So I will see you guys very, very soon. Hold your gun. Capybara. Goodbye. <laughs>